All right, so let's be a little bit more formal about what we mean by probability. We've informally discussed it as just the long run fraction of time where some event of interest occurs. And so let's lay down some of the groundwork so we can have this discussion a bit more formally, a bit more mathematically. So that's going to start out by just introducing a, key, a few key phrases here. So when we talk about the long run fraction of time where an event occurs, we really talk about the long run fraction of trials. So what do I mean by a trial? Well, I mean some sort of experiment, some sort of action. And that's a pretty broad term. So we were just talking about coin flips. Well, our experiment or our trial in that case would just be flipping a coin. If we're working for Comcast, we're studying customer churn, well, a trial would be checking, say, the retention status after the uh, contract expires. Did they stay or did they churn? If you're like me and you're always interested in trying to figure out the very best way to get to work the fastest way, maybe your trial would be you know, going to work and measuring the length of time that it took. Was it longer than 15 minutes? Was it shorter than 15 minutes? A trial is just some sort of experiment, some sort of action where you're going to measure something. And what are you going to measure? Well, the outcome is what we're going to focus in on. So each trial is going to have an outcome. And there might be just one. There might be 10. There might be a million. An outcome is just the possible result of some sort of trial. So if we're flipping a coin, our two outcomes are heads and tails. If we're studying churn, looking at customer retention, the customer either churned or they stayed, they renewed their contract. If we're measuring the length of time to go to work, well, we could measure the time itself, like 15 minutes, 12 seconds, or we could just record yeah, it took longer than 15 minutes versus it took shorter than 15 minutes. What we want to measure is up to us, but an outcome is just something that we might measure at the conclusion of a trial here. So when we sit down and talk about formally what probability refers to, very often we start out by discussing the sample space of our trial. So what is the sample space? Well, it's simply just the list of possible outcomes that we might observe when we conduct a trial. If we sit down and flip a coin, we're going to measure either heads or tails. The sample space is the set of those two possible outcomes. If we're going to go in time, how long it took for us to get to work, well, our sample space would be any positive number. Yeah, you know, technically I'm not going to get to work in, you know, two seconds, five seconds, etc. So there's some sort of lower bound. I don't really know what it is. But we can kind of say that just the sample space is, you know, any positive number here, consistent with the accuracy of the timepiece that I'm using. So the sample space is just a list of everything I might see when I conduct a trial, when I conduct an experiment. And when we talk about the probability of something occurring, we're going to use the special word event. So when we talk about probabilities, we really talk about the probability of some event that we're interested in. And that's just pretty much anything, one or more possible outcomes in that sample space. So we might talk about the probability of the event, the coin comes up heads. We might talk about the event, we observe a time between 13 and 19 minutes. Numerous outcomes in our sample space. So this frequency definition, we can now revisit and put a little bit more formalism to it. So we talk about the probability that some event occurs, one or more outcomes in our sample space. And when we say the long run fraction of time where that event occurs, that very informal way of discussing it, that's related to just the fraction of trials where our event of interest has occurred. And here's why it's a little bit underwhelming in our definition. We don't have, say, after a certain number of trials, it's left in that very generic, very vague, in the long run. Mathematically, we represent that with a limit. We essentially say, well, if we were to calculate the fraction, the number of trials in which our event occurs, divide that by the total number of trials that we've run so far, well, that probability is what this fraction converges to in the long run, meaning that the number of trials is going off towards larger and larger and larger values after an infinite number of trials. Now, there is a special kind of uh, uh, requirement on these trials here, namely that if we're going to use this frequentist view of probability, we're conducting a sequence of trials here, we're counting up the number of trials where our event occurs, we're calculating that ratio. For this to be a valid calculation, we need to make sure that each trial is independent so the results of previous trials don't affect what's going to happen in the future. And also, each of those trials is conducted under identical conditions. A little bit more on that later here. 
All right, so when I say the probability of flipping a fair coin and having heads come up is 50%, what that means is that in the long run, about 50% of flips turn up heads. So I kind of wish I had the word about in here. That would be a nice addition here. What we know is that we don't expect it to be exactly 50% after a certain number of trials. This 50% is a comment on the long run behavior of the fraction of flips that have come up heads. And this is really an important thing to really hit home. We saw this simulation. Probability of it being 50% doesn't mean that after a certain number of flips, like 50,000, we're going to measure exactly 50%. It's going to be kind of close, where it's really talking about the fraction of flips that have come up heads here. What are the odds? You said that. All right, so now's a good time to actually kind of talk about the difference between a few different words that people use when talking about probabilities. So in Bizen 533, in this class, and for the most part in the business analytics program, we're going to use the two words probability and chance interchangeably. Chance is a little bit easier to say. It's pretty easy to trip over some of the syllables with probability. So feel free to use the word chance. We're going to interpret that as the word probability. Odds actually means something very different. So when we discuss the chance of some event occurring, let's try to stick with using that word chance or using the word probability, because mathematically odds is defined in a completely different way. In fact, it has kind of an odd definition here. So mathematically, the odds of an event is related to the probability, but in a weird nonlinear way. So if I knew the probability of some event occurring was, say, 10%, the odds of that event would be 0.1 divided by 1 minus 0.1, so 0.1 over 0.9, or 1 ninth. And so this is why I don't like using the word odds. We see them all the time in, say, betting, but knowing that the odds of event is 1 ninth doesn't immediately hit home kind of anything in my gut. I don't get a gut feeling for what the frequency of that event is. I'd much rather just hear the probability or the chance is 10%. But here's how to translate between odds and probability if you want. And I have an additional slide about how to interpret the odds when you go and look at sports betting, etc. So I'm going to leave that behind. I'm not going to use the word, you know, what are the odds of this event occurring? That's not a thing where we want to do in business analytics. It's not as interpretable as saying just chance or probability. But it's important that you know that there is a difference here. So let's do an illustration that hits home personally. So I love Vegas. I've been going to Vegas for, gosh, almost uh, a little over 20 years now. I started out counting cards, you know, doing blackjack, trying to make millions doing that way. Obviously, it didn't happen. I'm here teaching you guys. Uh, but I've grown to love slot machines more and more over the years. And there's this one particular slot machine that I've really grown quite fond of. And that's called Gems Wild Tiles. It's not like your standard slot machine where you have the reels kind of going around. And then, you know, if you get three cherries, you win a whole bunch. It's a whole different game. And so here's me way back in the day, say 50 pounds lighter without the beard, all that stuff. Just living it up, playing a whole bunch of games of gems here. And what's great is that even though you can't really find gems in a casino anymore, if you do, take a picture, send it to me, like you're going to be my new best friend if that happens. People have programmed these games online and you're able to play them. So let's fire it up, why not? So, number one, odds maker, that's always going to be me, that's my favorite screen name, you know, quite appropriate here. But let's play some gems wild tiles. Let me kind of break it down how this game works. Hopefully you'll find it as interesting as I do. So whenever you click start, whenever you play a new game, you're going to be presented with a random arrangement of these th uh, tiles here. So three diamonds, four sapphires, some big rubies, small rubies, some pink hearts, etc. And sometimes something really cool is going to happen. That's not cool at all. Game over, nothing really happened. But what ends up happening is that if the jewels are arranged just right, kind of like in the game Bejeweled, you're going to get a chain reaction. You're going to win a bunch of money. So specifically, what are we looking for? Let's play a few games here. Here's three diamonds. You'll notice that the three diamonds match. The center tile gets replaced by a wild tile. And the other tiles disappear. You get that chain reaction where they're falling, and the game checks again to see, well, does anything happen? 
So I can sit here, I can literally play this game for hours. And in fact, I'm gonna link to a video where I was playing well over a hundred games before something really cool happened that I wanted to kind of show you guys. But anyway, I want to know what's the probability that we win something, that I win something. You don't get any of this money. It's just me. So from the frequentist view, we actually have the tools to come up with a reasonable guess of what this probability is. Let's just sit down, play game after game after game of gems, kind of my dream come true, and let's keep track of the fraction of trials, the fraction of games, where I win something. And so let's just say, say for the sake of illustration, it's not like I wasted two weeks of winter break a few years ago programming this whole thing on my own to answer all the questions I had about gems. And I did, I did do that. Um, but let's just say it's 45%. So let's say the probability of winning something in, James is, or in gems is 45%. What does that look like if we were to sit down and run repeated trials? So each game is independent from each other. The boards are all being generated uh, kind of separate from each other. So we have independence, we have identical conditions. Well, we might see something like this. If I were to plot the fraction of games where I won something, eventually it's going to settle down, that fraction, very, very close to that probability of that event occurring, this 45%. And so, because I don't want to keep you in the dark any longer, here's kind of the, the secret tool, one of the main tools we use in business analytics to know just how close we got to the right answer. Kind of the spoiler alert of all of this is that once we've sat down and conducted an experiment, we've measured a fraction of trials where our event occurred, we're going to call that a p-hat, we can actually say that we've nailed down the true probability to within a certain range, more or less, and that certain range is just whatever you originally measured a p hat plus or minus two times this fraction with the square root. Now, we'll discover this at a much later time. It turns out that we can derive this mathematically without too much extra work here. But after a certain you know, sequence of trials you've conducted, you wanna know, okay, here's what I measured. How close am I to the true probability? Well, here you go. This is what we're gonna to refer to as a confidence interval. But we'll get to that at a later point. Now, I've already left you a little bit underwhelmed with the frequentist view of probability because number one, it's not like we can ever truly measure the probability of some event. That fraction kind of edges closer and closer and closer as we conduct more and more trials. So almost inherently that number is in a, unobservable. But some other complications that you want to be aware of. So remember a few slides ago I said that this was true, this fraction kind of converging to the probability, as long as those trials that we were conducting were independent, meaning the outcome of future trials independent of past trials, and they were conducted under identical conditions. In other words, we couldn't really tell the difference between one trial and another before we conducted it and measured the outcome. Now, in the real world, that's actually pretty hard to manage. Computer simulation, absolutely no problem. But imagine trying to sit down and figure out the probability that you would be able to make a free throw. So you do your best, you stand, say, 10 feet away from the basket, you shoot, and after 100 different shots, you've made 32 of them. So a good guess might be 32%. Is that a good estimate of the probability that you would make a free throw? Well, in this case, probably not. And in this case, why is that the case? Well, it's because those shots are unlikely to be really independent of one another. Yeah, if you're going to shoot 100 different times, you're going to get fatigued at certain points. Maybe you'll go into a cold streak. Or if you start hitting a few, you might have a little bit of muscle memory. You might kind of learn how to make the next few shots. Those shots, the outcomes are going to be a little bit related to one another. So it's a complication. That frequentist view assumes that each trial is independent, identical conditions. And in this case, for what we want to measure, we don't have that. So that fraction isn't necessarily going to be a good estimate of the probability of that event.
Likewise, if I really wanted to know, well, what's the probability I can make it to work in, say, less than 15 minutes, I'm going to have a really hard time ensuring that those trials are conducted you know, fairly in terms of the frequencies viewpoint under identical conditions and independent of one another. So why might that be the case? Well, maybe I leave to work at different times. So I expect the traffic to be a little bit different. The weather might be different from one trial to another as well. These definitely aren't trials that are conducted under independent or identical conditions here. So that's a complication. It's very hard to ensure all your trials are independent from one another and they're conducted under the same conditions. Then another complication is that you just might not have the time to sit down and actually you know, collect a whole bunch of outcomes, conduct that uh, trial, or that experiment a whole bunch of times and see what happens. So for instance, this is something that UT would love to be able to have on its website. You know, there's an 80% chance that the student that graduates from UT is ultimately successful. So how could we actually measure that? Well, according to the frequencies view, we need to keep track of what happens to UT students and measure what fraction of those students were ultimately successful. So, all right, that's going to take a lot of time. You know, how do we gauge success? Maybe what they're doing 20 years after graduation. You know, those trials are going to be coming in really slowly. We're not going to have the luxury of building up enough trials to really feel like we're going to be in the long run. And same thing for a lot of other events. You know, if we're going to talk about, well, the probability that someone who tested positive for COVID has some lasting heart issues, that probability is, say, 15%, we're not going to know really what that probability is for a really long time. Even if those trials were independent, identical conditions, it's just very time consuming to get one of those trials here. And other times, actually a lot of times, it's not really possible to even think in terms of a repeated trial. So if I were to make the statement, the probability that it rains tomorrow, which is as of the time of this recording, August 7th, 2020, if I were to say that probability is 30%, does that really mean anything? Because this particular day, August 7th, occurs only once. I can't really glimpse into alternative universes, which would be really cool, by the way, to kind of see how it could have evolved. I'm only going to be presented with one instance of August 7th. So ultimately, we're going to be careful about how we use the word probability. We do have a strict definition according to the frequentist view of what probability is, but there's going to be a lot of events out there that we're not really going to be able to talk about the probability of using this framework. So you'll answer some questions on the homework and in the class discussions about this. Uh, but just uh, kind of one last example here, just to kind of get you thinking, let's look at this silver dollar. So I don't know why I have a silver dollar, but I do. This coin's, you know, one of those few $1 coins from the U.S. It's from 1976, my birth year. I'm old. So I'm going to pose to you the following question. We know that the probability of flipping a coin and having it come up heads is 50%, but what if I do something like this? What if I flip it? I'm going to try to do this in front of the camera. Hopefully I catch it. Boom. So I'm hiding it. What if I were to say, all right, the probability that the coin has heads face up is 50%. Is that a meaningful statement? Well, no, it's not. I know that in the long run, when I flip a coin, this one or kind of any other in particular, I expect about 50% of flips to come up heads, but this experiment has already happened. It either is heads or it isn't. I don't actually know what the answer is, but here's gonna be one of these key limitations of the word probability. We're not gonna use the word probability to describe our ignorance about the true state of reality. So this coin either is or is not heads. If I were to go and check to see, well, what is the outcome? I'm always going to measure heads. Or I'm always going to measure tails. So the probability that this coin that I just flipped here has come up heads, it's either 100% or 0%. I just don't know what it is. And because we're studying probability, we're going to be as pedantic as possible. I'm going to say that you know we're not using probability to quantify what we don't know about reality. The probability in this case is either 100% or 0%. I just don't know what it is. So let's take a peek. Ah, it actually turned up heads here. So that's what I want you to keep in mind. Because we're going to be pedantic about it, because this is a class in probability, we want to know what the limitations of talking about probability are. And so what we want to make sure to remember 
is that under the frequentist definition, what we're going to stick with with business analytics, we do not use the word probability to quantify our ignorance about the state of the world. So most of the time when we talk about probability, it's about some generic event, not something very specific like the probability that this particular coin is going to come up heads on its next flip. Yes, if this was a fair coin in the long run, 50% of its flips would come up heads more or less. But if I were to talk about a specific instance of that, now, nah, can't use the word probability for that. I need to use something a little bit more informal. So one more example, just because we have Kenny Miller in this class. Kenny Miller was a undergraduate here at UT. He was a Melton scholar as well. And he's just an overall great guy and great student. So he won't mind me actually bringing up this example here. In fact, he saw it actually, I think, in a class that he took with me last semester. So as a Melton scholar, one thing that I had them do, uh, we had five of them, is they did one of those uh, escape games. So they got locked in a room, they had to solve a sequence of puzzles, and they had to escape. And to no big surprise, the Melton scholars, being some of the best and brightest at UT, they escaped without any issue. They got out of, out of uh, the room in 49 minutes. And so here's Kenny right here, big old smile. And so here's an example about Kenny. So let's imagine that Kenny is late to class. Now, he's really never late, so it's not a very realistic example. Let's just say that Ken, we'll call him Ken for this example, is late here. So what if I were to say, okay, I noticed that Ken is late today. The probability he overslept is 80%. That's not a statement that I can make with the frequentist notion of probability here. So we kind of you know, get what it, what it means to say that there's an 80% chance of this occurring. It's kind of more likely than not that if Ken's gonna be late, well, it's probably because he overslept versus got you know, caught in traffic or slipped on a banana peel and is on the floor somewhere. You know, we get a kind of a gut feeling for what that 0.8 is for the chance, but from the frequentist view of probability, this isn't something we can really say. So why is that? Well because this has kind of a known outcome. Kenny either has or hasn't overslept. We just don't really know which of these worlds we're living in. And so since we don't use probability to quantify our ignorance about the world, this is not something that we can talk about the probability of. Sure, Kenny might be late today, but we can't say that the probability that he overslept is 80%. The probability that he's out there petting dogs is 2%. That's just not something we can talk about with the frequentist view of probability here. So how do we get around that? Because there are some events, you know, when I flipped that coin, I didn't show it to you and I asked you, hey, what's the probability that the coin shows up heads? You know, we kind of kind of feel like it's 50% and that makes sense to us. We can go and talk to anyone we want to and it's going to make sense to them as well. So how do we get around that? How do we get around the fact that the frequentist view is just really gosh darn restrictive and sometimes really not that useful to us? Well, as I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture, you know, actually what probability is, is somewhat controversial. We haven't really uh, kind of converged on one definition of what probability is. And so there's a whole other camp called the Bayesian approach, which actually tries to make sense about this other angle that we're trying to take it. Yes, it makes sense to us that after I flip that coin, there's a 50% chance that it was heads or tails because that's just what coins are like. And so the Bayesian view of probability tries to allow us to meaningfully make those sorts of statements. So in the Bayesian view of probability, we actually do use probability to quantify what we do and what we don't know about the world. If we something happened, but we don't know exactly what did happen, it's perfectly reasonable to say the probability of this is 75%. And we can use the Bayesian framework to talk about the probability of some specific outcome of a trial, a specific trial here. And in fact, it allows us to incorporate prior knowledge of how likely we think events are to occur versus not occur. It's a much more flexible and kind of useful framework. Um, for business analytics, since we're always studying about uh, frequencies anyway, you know, looking to see how often something occurs, the frequentist notion makes a lot of sense. But there are other options out there. And in fact, there's a whole nother set of math where you can kind of implement to do this Bayesian approach. It's pretty cool. Uh, when I was a master's student, that's what we studied, the Bayesian approach for probability and statistics. Uh, but we're going to stick with the, the frequentist view here.